Three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Building and Contracts Committee for Monday, February 7, 2022. In accordance with the board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person meet committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee member meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board committee members will say their name before making and seconding a motion, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Slate, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Jose? Present. Mr. McMillian? Present. Ms. Hen? Mr. Kuhn? Mr. Offerman. Thank you. Ms. Slade, please call the role of staff members present in today's meeting. Ms. Anderson. Dr. Boswell McComas. Present. Thank you. Ms. Charlie Green. Dr. Wheatley Phillip. Present. Dr. Yarborough. Dr. Zarchin. Present. Ms. Howie. Ms. Ann F Rung Faru Sangarun. Ms. Lowry. Dr. Jones. Present. Thank you. Dr. Roberts. Mr. Dixit. Present. Mr. Saris. Present. Ms. Shea. Dr. Wistead. Present. Doc, I'm sorry, Mr. Plate. Present. If there are additional staff participating that were not mentioned, please state your name. Hi, Susan. This is Ms. Shea. I apologize. I'm here. Thank you. Anyone else? Good afternoon. Hi, this is Kim Ferguson. I'm here. Kim Ferguson. Thank you. And did someone else state yes, a name? Yes, Doug Elmendorf. Doug Elmendorf. Thank you. April Lewis. Thank you, April. Leanne Schubert. Thank you, Ms. Schubert. Tina Dr. Nelson. Jeff. I'm sorry. Tina Nelson. Thank you. Michelle Stansberry. Dr. Jeffrey Holmes. Thank you. Uh, Pedro Augusto. Thank you, sir. And anyone Wendell else? Burrell. I'm sorry. Linda Barone. And Michael Archbold. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Ms. Slade. Uh, we'll begin today's meeting with the preliminary design presentation for Deer Park Elementary School. Uh, Mr. Dixit, please proceed. So. Oh, good is Joe's and members of the board. Um, as you'll recall, part of the capital improvement program board approved design and construction of a replacement school for Deer Park Elementary School. Today we are here to present the preliminary design for Deer Park Elementary School. The design is uh, the similar design uh, that was used for Dundalk Elementary School, Chadwick Elementary School, and most recently Summit Park Elementary School. It is the same prototype that have been modified to meet the needs of Deer Park Elementary School. While we build all schools to be energy efficient, 
this is the first school that's going to generate as much energy as it consumes, making it the first net zero school uh, of our system and the first net zero elementary school in the state of Maryland. So we are very excited about it. Uh, the completion is targeted for September 2025. In developing the design, we have closely worked with Dr. Jones, so I would like to acknowledge her guidance, uh, Dr. Basil McComas and Ms. Melissa DiDonato. I'm very happy to see that some of those folks are here. Before we start the presentation, I'd like to uh, acknowledge our internal team uh, as part of our construction improvement office under the leadership of Merrill Plate. We have Michael Archbold here, uh, who's the chief architect and the brain trust behind this project. Along with him, um, we have Linda Barone, who's the project manager. Linda, if you're here, you can turn the camera on if you choose to. And the project has been designed by uh, Grimm and Parker, and we have Melissa Wilfong of Grimm and Parker, who's here. Uh, so we'll quickly go over the presentation. I'd like to remind the board that this does not require board approval. This is for your review. And if you have any questions, please save till the end of the presentation. So with that, um, Melissa, the screen is yours. Thank you, Pete. Um, and thank you to the rest of the BCPS team and uh, to the board for having the opportunity to be here this afternoon. So we're going to. Um, oops, I'm not advancing. So quickly, the agenda, we're going to start out with some project information and project goals, go through the site design and the building design, and then show some renderings and finally open up to questions. So first, the location of Deer Park Elementary School is to the west of the county, and it's just uh, west of the uh, Lions Mill Elementary School on Lions Mill Road. Um, the existing building is 58,000 square feet. As Pete said, it is a replacement school, and it is an evolution of the prototype, most recently of the uh, Summit Park prototype. We were here a couple months ago to present. The existing state rated capacity of Deer Park is 461, and the state proposed state rated capacity of the new building will be 735. It's on 22 acres of site, and there is one regional program in the in this school, which is an ECL, ECLS pre-kindergarten program. So just talking a little bit about the educational goals of the BCPS um, elementary school ed spec. And that's to promote a flexible integrated technology throughout the building. Um, the building has several collaborative use spaces located conveniently for each grade level. There are also a few spaces particularly designed to maximize hands on learning, and those include the maker space and the digital learning lab, as well as the flex flexible centralized learning commons. We've increased the program efficiencies in this prototype by creating some multi-purpose and shared spaces. We promote and design for school safety, both inside and outside the building. Um, the site is arranged to, to separate vehicular traffic from the pedestrian traffic, with cars and buses each having their dedicated entry, and uh, pedestrians being able to circulate onto the site without crossing any of those. The admin area is located to the front of the building overlooking these areas. Inside the building, the building's organized by zones to be able to promote security, ease of vis uh, visual, visible observation, and to allow the building to function for after hours use. Some of the enhanced security features include lighting outside of the site. We have a security vestibule with electronic access control, the building's controlled by a card reader system. There are 50 plus cam cameras located inside and outside the building, and there's a dedicated command center located within the building, which has the ability and all the infrastructure to communicate both inside the building and with the external first responders. 
So some of the really exciting new uh, attributes of this version of the prototype is like Pete mentioned, it is a uh, net zero has a net zero goal, which means that the building produces uh, as as much or more energy than the building uses. Interesting components about that is it is the first net zero school in Baltimore. We track our ability to achieve the net zero goal through the use of an EUI or energy use index. And this building is targeting an EUI of less than or equal to 23. It will also be the first photovoltaic array for BCPS. A little bit of history about net zero schools in Maryland. There are three operating schools, all of which were funded by the MEA net zero grant. That includes an L, uh, two pre-K through eight schools and a middle school um, in Howard County. So this is the first net zero elementary school. So why pursue net zero? There's statistics about the, the many benefits of net zero school, but some of those include a healthy school environment, um, enhanced sustainable policies and occupant behavior, increased teacher retention. It does provide enhanced educational opportunities and curriculum tie-ins. Obviously, it reduces the long-term cost through the reduction of energy costs. And this building will be designed to significantly exceed the LEED uh, silver certification required by the High Performance Building Act. Um, many net zero schools achieve platinum, so we'll, we'll be keeping our eye on that. So some of the strategies toward net zero. Many of these strategies are things that uh, we have been working with BCPS in as this prototype has, has iterated over time. So a ground source heat pump system or a geothermal system is widely in use in elementary schools in Baltimore County, as well as LED lighting and lighting controls. They've all become commonplace and are now code mandated. New elements for this design include the demand controlled ventilation. So the ventilation is separated from heating and cooling and delivered to the spaces on an as needed basis. Also includes a plug load control system which will turn off outlets if equipment is accidentally left on overnight. We always include an outlet dedicated to stay on in case there's an educational function like a fish tank or uh, grow lamps that are present in the school and that outlet will be identified. We're also using insulated concrete form for construction. Not only does that increase the uh, insulation value of the envelope, but it also increases the air tightness of the construction. We're including in the building an interactive display screen, which allows occupants to see immediately see the impacts of their behavior on the energy use and toward achieving the net zero goal. OK, zooming into the site design, um, the building is located outside of the 695 Beltway and just south of 795. Within the one mile and two mile limits are several other elementary schools in the area, as well as a middle school directly on the site and the high schools in the area. Zooming into the site, here you see the Deer Park, existing Deer Park Elementary School along Lions Mill Road and the existing Deer Park Middle School to the south side of the site. Some of the features on the site includes two site entry points. The bus drop off is along the front of the existing school with entry directly into the main entrance. There is a classroom addition to the west of the existing building and a service area to the east. Behind the building, there are soft pay, play and hard paved play areas. And the visitor and staff parking is also to the east of the existing building. Here are a few pictures of the existing building, the upper left being the front entrance. To the right are the playgrounds behind the building. And just below that is the, a picture of the classroom addition. The service area is on the top. The bottom image is the, the site of the new um, uh, Deer Park Middle School or Elementary School. So back to the site, the new building is located along these play fields at the corner of Lions Mill and Merrittsville Road. 
um, very easy phasing to allow the existing building to remain in occupation and, and, and occupied until the new building is completed and then students moved out over to the new building over a break. So zooming into that site, first we're going to look at the vehicular transportation for the proposed new school. Um, there is an entrance by the bus drop off to the south side of the school. Buses enter off of Marriottsville Road. They can circulate through the bus drop off. Students are dropped off along the curb and then enter into the main corridor in the building. The main entry is on the north side. The cars access off of Lions, New Lions Mill Road. They circulate around the parking lot. And then can students can be dropped off or picked up on the curb along the front of the school and circulate back out to Lions Mill Road. The service area is to the east of uh, the west of the building between those two circulations. There's two pedestrian entry. Again, the entry points for pedestrian are designed to avoid any crossing of the of the vehicular traffic points. So if you're coming from the north along Lions Mill Road, there's a crosswalk at that intersection that students will cross across. Um, if you're coming on the south side of Lions Mill Road or on the east side of Marriottsville Road, you'll circulate up and into the site on those walkways. Students can enter both to the south or to the north entry of the building. There's also a current sidewalk along the back of the middle school, which we will connect into the circulation pathways um, onto the new building. There's two playgrounds and two paved play areas outside the courtyard. There's also play fields designated for the elementary school use. There's multiple ways we can provide solar for this building. The first option is to maximize the amount of, of PV located on the roof. So we'll do that first. There's also a possibility to locate some ground mounted PV in the front of the school. And we're also considering pursuit of a uh, parking lot structure, which could be eligible for a Maryland Energy Administration grant. Design of these elements are um, under underway and exactly the placement of PV is yet to be determined. Going inside the building, the main entry to the north, um, the bus entry to the south, and there's a dedicated rec and parks entry. The orange areas are the dedicated rec and park spaces. The building separated so it can be zoned for after hours use into a public and an academic side and the doors can be locked down to, uh, to secure that separation. Entering into the vestibule, you enter into the reception area, and once, once checked in, you're allowed to enter into the main corridor. Um, at the front of the building is the administrative and guidance suite and the health suite. Once you're in the main corridor, you access the first intersection point of the school, and you can circulate down to the administrative suites or into the front classroom wing. There's also access directly into the learning commons off of that main intersection. Proceeding down the corridor, entry into the gymnasium, and then entry into the dining room or cafeteria. Behind the cafeteria is the stage. There's a main uh, stair in this corridor to ease circulation up into the classrooms on the second floor and to allow those students to come directly down into these public spaces. And then the second main intersection um, in the school is to the second classroom wing or to the corridor that accesses the music rooms, the stage and some of the service areas. And then the bus, the entrance for students being dropped off from bus uh, is to the back of the building. Some other spaces on the first floor. The restrooms are located both for student use and for after hours use. The music classrooms are behind the stage for easy access. On the first floor, we have first grade classrooms, maker space and art classrooms, pre-kindergarten classrooms and kindergarten classrooms. Moving to the second floor, there's second and third grade classrooms, share a classroom wing 
with collaborative spaces for each. And each classroom has direct access to an extended learning area. On the north classroom rank wing is fourth and fifth grade classrooms, each with their collaborative area and each with their extended learning areas. So now we're going to get into some of the renderings and visualizations for the building. This is the entry of the student drop off area. This is a view from above that shows the configuration with the two classroom bars in the main entrance. Uh, you can see the bus loop in the in the background. And now we're going to run through a, um, a video showing some animation. So we're going to start off with that view overlooking the school. And here, here, uh, oh, I'm sorry, here's the location along the 26 uh, route corridor and um, the location on the play fields. So you can see some of the solar panels proposed on this view. Now when we go down to street level, showing the entrance to the building, we anticipate the possibility of also solar panels on the canopy, into the vestibule and into the reception area. So both of those steps will require you to be buzzed in. Once you're in the reception area, you can also then be buzzed out into the main corridor. You can see how the entire corridor is easily observed. You can see into the learning commons. And into the learning commons, there are a couple different educational spaces in here designed for different size kids. You can see it's open and easily observed from one central point. Into the dining room across the way in the stage um, along the side of the dining room. The operable wall is open to the gym in this view, and you could show that the gymnasium connects to that dining room. Back out to the main corridor and up that main stair, we're on the second floor. And here you can see how some of the wash, uh, the wash hand washing is outside in the corridor to increase observations of students after they use the restroom. So into a typical classroom, you can see the extended learning area with the glass to the back of this view. Some of the variety of furniture that we have in a classroom. Out to the collaborative area. Again, multiple ways in which this space can be arranged for student use. And then back out to the uh, aerial view above. We're going to take a second to um, look at some of these renderings a little more closely. So this is the reception area. Again, there's a display board in here. There's a check in kiosk and you are buzzed into and out of the space to allow access to the school. Here's again a view of that main corridor to the left is the first classroom wing. You can see the visual connection between the front um, entrance and the rear entrance for students coming on bus. You can see into the learning commons. The dining room with the stage in the far side are the serving lines. In the gymnasium, we have the opportunity for a lot of natural light into the gymnasium because of its orientation. It won't provide any glare. And then the learning commons to the right, you can see the learning commons has a view out to the courtyard. This is again the typical classroom. Just want to focus here on the variety of furniture, the use of the mobile technology, multiple ways in which this space can be arranged for different learning activities. And then in the collaborative space, there's a little bit more comfortable furniture, and this furniture is intended to allow students to rearrange and, and make themselves comfortable in the way they learn best. We don't yet know the, the schedule for the project. We're anticipating funding from the Build to Learn Act. I um, mean, once that's uh, secured, then we'll be able to nail down the actual construction start dates. So uh, thank you and I'll open up to questions. Thank you, Ms. Wilfgong. Um, any questions, board members? Ms. Joes, this is Rod McMillian. I have a couple questions. Go ahead, Mr. McMillian. Uh, fantastic graphics of, of all the different, you know, entrance ways and exits ways and that kind of thing. Uh, two questions on the, the entrance from the school bus loop on the back side. 
is there you mentioned there's a secured foyer area coming through the the main entrance but that back entrance where the kids get off the bus and comes in is that a secured entrance too that entrance is only open for arrival and dismissal otherwise that entrance is locked and you can't you can't get in through there okay and then on the the first floor graphic i don't know what number that was but i noticed that the now, Mr. Pete knows this, but I taught physical education for 35 years in Baltimore County, and I was in a bunch of different schools and before I, I went to a high school and I was there for 25 years. But I taught elementary school and I noticed that. Can we can we find that graphic? It was yes. the first floor and it showed the gym and it showed. It was like a schematic kind of thing, I think. I'm yeah. getting that. There, there you go. go. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Now. What I think, just something I just want to say this, is when I taught elementary, there was one gym, and I don't know if it was Summit Park, there was, uh, there was one gym that had access to the restrooms from the gym, which made it really, really nice because the kids didn't have to leave the gym to go in the hallway to go to the restroom. Now, I see where those bathrooms are right there, correct? Right. Not, if, if I'm looking, if this is a east, west, north map, those restrooms are right to the north of the gym, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so do they have doors to enter the gym or no? It doesn't appear that way. They do not currently have doors. Okay. And just something to think about. And I know it would be, you know, you'd have to work out, you know, kids in those restrooms and having access to the gym and vice versa kids going from the gym to those restrooms to the hallway but that might be something to think about if you could lock those doors and the only reason i say that is because as an elementary physical education teacher that was a great feature that the kids didn't have to leave the gym to go to the restroom and i actually taught them and i get all excited thinking about this stuff mr pete knows me is is i actually taught the kids how to go in that restroom one at a time and if they went in and somebody was already in there they knew to come back out and it was it was really something to watch that and, and how it transformed. But just an idea about having access, even if those doors were, you know, of course, being able to be locked from the inside and the outside. And it, it, it periodically it would allow access to those from the gym. But you guys do. You're the experts on this. You do what you want. Thank you very much for your for your presentation. Thank, Thank you, you. Mr. McMillian. Um, you made a good point. Um, as an environmental engineer, just seeing the net zero, I got pretty excited uh, seeing the net zero label. Our children are very tuned into climate change, so it's a great start. Uh, I love the building organization and separation of ideas. I love the little attention to details. Clearly, you've worked closely with staff and teachers. So my question uh, maybe to Mr. Dixit, is the old school going to be demolished after construction? Yes, that's our plan to demolish the old school. But, right. but, the plan, but the plans are not final on that. So I want to be on record saying that we are exploring potential uses for that building. But you essentially lost all of the ball field spaces. So would that be made up because there's a middle school behind it as well that probably used that space for ball fields, um, baseball and other sports. Do we have that in the plan to kind of make up for that area lost in terms of ball fields? So, Mike, you want to handle that? You have you are closer to it. Uh, yes, we we have an initial layout um, to uh, get all of the the ball fields that we can possibly get back in. But if if the building stays, then that would reduce a little bit of the ball fields. It wouldn't reduce all the ball fields, but it would reduce. I think we would lose one ball field option if the building stayed. Uh, but we've been able to provide. Um, another practice field and a base, a little small softball field on the one side, and then we have uh, other fields on the remaining part of the property. So, Miss Joe's adding to that, there are also issues about part of the site being owned by us and part of the site owned by county. And if we are going to use some of the land that is owned by county to build new school, then we have to somehow. Uh, deal with them about either replenishing their part of the site 
or coming up with some plan where both of us can uh, use the old site and or building together. And that's what we are. We are right now talking with them as to best use of that old facility. All right, thank you. And I see Mr. Kuhn has a question. Uh, we have a couple of minutes, so uh, Mr. Kuhn, go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks for the presentation. Um, I have two uh, two questions or two areas I'd like to talk about. The first has to do with the security cameras. You said there's many cameras, I guess over 50. Um, are we connecting uh, so that uh, law enforcement like Baltimore County uh, police can access um, those feeds in, in an emergency? That is correct. OK, and they don't have to go on site. They can literally just pull it up from wherever they are. That's correct. OK, great. And then uh, the second thing I'd like to talk about is the net zero approach. I'm fully on board with this and I think it's fantastic. So I applaud you all for doing this. Um, <clears throat> is the the electricity generated from the solar panels? Is that just going to is, is there any battery storage on campus or is that just go straight back into the overall school and into the grid? That goes into the grid. There's no there's no battery storage. OK, and then the extensions that you're talking about um, over parking in other areas, when and how would those decisions be made? Are they are they being funded by grants or this straight out of the capital going towards the school or how is that going to work? So, so right now, right okay. now, all of the project is funded by capital funds. All right, are there any plans for um, possibly putting like a car charger, electric car charging station on site or anything along those lines? Melissa, you want to take that question? Yes, we are exploring that option. I, I anticipate that we would include that. OK, great. Thank you. That's all. Ms. Joes, I have one other additional question real quick for Mr. Pete. Go ahead, Mr. 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 Pete, is it too early to talk about the options that you're exploring for the old building? Um, the fact of the matter is that we ourselves haven't thought about it too much. There has been requests from other departments in county to use that that building. There are other uses potentially in that part of the county that could be good for us and our educational needs. So that has to be explored further. I did not have conversation with the superintendent on that subject. So anything that I'll be sharing with you will be premature other than that it's all open and it's subject to approval by county because part of that site is owned by county. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. If you have any ideas, we would like to hear from you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Dixon, and thank you for the presentation. We look forward to the uh, final design coming to the board as well. Thank so, you for your time, and thank you, Melissa, for a nice presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Ms. Slade, it looks like we have a quorum, so I will go ahead and start the building and contracts. Uh, Mr. Saris. Please state your name for the record and proceed with presenting the first contract. Uh, good evening. This is George Saris, Executive Director of Fiscal Services. And the first item that we have is ASI 81122 Blended Learning and Online Student Courses. Uh, this is a new contract for the Office of Educational Options. Approval is requested for a five-year contract with uh, nine recommended bidders and contract spending of $2,901,758. Thank you, Mr. Saris. Uh, committee members, any questions? Please state your name and proceed. Hearing none. Hi, this is, this is Russ King, just real quick. Um, 
there seem to be multiple vendors. Um, is the is the idea that we're going to use all these vendors uh, and we have a plan for it, or are we just making them available and we don't have a plan for it? Mr. Chairman, I think Ms. Schubert could best answer that. Thank Sorry, you. I jumped in, George. Um, so the list of vendors is um, a list that comes from the Maryland State Department of Education. So these are the approved vendors for the Maryland Virtual Learning Opportunity Courses, which are a part of what we use this contract for. So we've used that list. Um, currently, we um, use some of these vendors. There's potential in the future that we would use others as well. But the list comes from the MVLO from MSDE, and that's a lot of letters. <laughs> Thanks. I guess I, I I understand what you just said, um, but I'm just trying to get to the do we have a plan to use all of you know what everything that they provide or are there specific ones we're more interested in? We don't really care about the others. I'm just curious because you know anytime I see multiple vendors, I I have no idea what the plan for the money is. Uh, so if, I, I don't know if you you actually have that information if you could share it. Sure, so currently of the nine vendors listed, we have worked with four of those vendors to provide a variety of, of um, opportunities for students in the county. What these, um, having the nine vendors included on the contract, what that would allow us to do is as we look at these fully online MVLO courses, which is just one of the um, options that the contract allows us. Um, it would allow us, uh, let's say moving forward, we had a, um, a high level AP course that we wanted to expand and um, the use of. It would allow us to work with that vendor if they had that course available that's approved by MSDE. So currently work with four. Um, I can't tell you about the other five, but this would give us the flexibility if we needed to expand those offerings that we could work with one of those vendors approved by the state. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Any questions? Hearing none, uh, Mr. No, Mr. Saris, please proceed with yes. the next contract. The next item, LLY 414-22, Evidence-Based Thinking and Writing Program. This is a new contract for an evidence-based thinking and writing program for the Office of Social Studies. Approval is requested for a five-year contract with one recommended bidder and contract spending authority of $1.34 million. Thank you, Mrs. Sarris. Um, it looks like Mr. Kuhn has a question. I have a real quick question. Did this come recommended from the um, CNI committee? The It was presented to the curriculum committee on January 20th. I don't know that they provide recommendations, uh, but okay. they do answer all questions that are raised at the time. Uh oh, Dr. McComas is on. <laughs> yes, hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, yes, Ms. Jones, I can share that this was um, approved at the curriculum committee to move forward. Um, thank you. Mr. Q, please go ahead with your question. Thank you. Um, the only thing that I want to point out is the the title. This is all specific to social social studies, correct? That is correct, but it does. It's all part of the um, evidence based reading and writing skill set uh, that actually runs throughout um, all of the um, humanities, if you will. Uh, evidence based reading and writing is a part of our argumentative um, reasoning and writing. Um, standards and so my partner uh, in the work, Ms. Shea, is of course on, so I'll turn it over if you want to add anything else. But this is specifically to uh, document analysis. As you know, Mr. Kuhn, I know you have a number of your own children who have taken advanced placement courses in social studies, no doubt. Um, and this is a key skill set uh, that not only prepares them for advanced placement courses, but fundamentally also builds that um, reading, uh, analysis, and writing. Um, skill set across the grade level. So again, I'll turn it over to Ms. Shea. Um, I was just going to add that thank you, Dr. McComas, and everything you said, especially as a social studies teacher, is perfect. 
Um, what I would add to Mr. Kuhn's point is that this contract does extend to all teachers in the building for those cross curricular opportunities and in fact our elementary pilots. So as you can see, part of this contract is that we're expanding the use of DBQ into elementary grades. Um, in the pilot, it actually has been an interdisciplinary um, project with ELA because there is so much reading and writing and speaking and listening inherent in the use of the resources. So it actually will go beyond, but uh, your question, um, it is the most directly connected to the social studies curriculum. So that part is accurate, but the contract allows for um, every teacher in the building to have access and every student. Great. I, I've I went to the DBQ project and I started bouncing around on their uh, website to learn more about it. It looks it's very focused on social studies. That's why I pointed it out because we talk about reading and we talk about writing and the importance of of those elements and evidence based, uh, you know, uh, uh, curriculum. Uh, so I just wanted to be clear because sure. this is this is specific to social studies well, even in the lower grades. So what I would add is that the content um, approaches social studies topics. So they are exploring uh, moments in history, time period specific. Um, so for example, one of the ones I got to visit in elementary school was um, they were asking fifth graders to consider whether or not uh, they would stay with General Washington as he was going through that hard, hard winter at Valley Forge. Would you stay or would you go? And they were examining multiple sources. So you're certainly right that in terms of content, um, it is aligned to social studies content, but as I mentioned in this particular example, many of our ELA standards expect students to synthesize across resources as early as grade four and grade five. Um, they also ask them to make inferences, to understand vocabulary, multiple meaning words. Um, and what I will share that we're particularly excited about because these topics and the idea of being detectives, if you will, looking at these primary and secondary source documents, some of the feedback that we got and that we shared at the last curriculum committee meeting in January, um, the students are really engaged and they're doing more writing um, and are engaged in more um, sustained evidence based writing because they're so motivated by some of this topic. So you're not wrong that it is specific to the curricular content of some of the themes and standards in social studies, um, but it absolutely has um, interdisciplinary applications for students for sure. And that's great and I fully support it because before you know I've, I've asked questions specifically about evidence based writing curriculum. So I'm happy to see us move in any direction that's to providing support writing. That. Me um, too. The last thing that I wanted to quickly ask because I noticed that it says that you're migrating from print to online. Is print still available it or is. just a pure? OK, that's yep. all I need to know. Yep. Blend it <laughs> all the you. way. Thanks. <laughs> Blend it all the way. I like it. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Kuhn. Thanks, Megan. Yep. Thank you, Ms. Shea. Um, hearing no more questions, Mr. Saris, please proceed with the next contract. Yes, thank you. The next item, JBO 709-22, Advanced Placement Summer Institute. This is a new sole source contract for professional development for advanced placement teachers for the Department of Academic Services. Approval is requested for a one year contract with one recommended bidder and contract spending authority of $115,000. Thank you, Mrs. Saris. Committee members, any questions? Hearing none, Mrs. Saris, please proceed with the next contract. Thank you. The next item, GDA 313-22, Ambulance, EMS, and other special service vehicles. Um, this is a new cooperative contract for a highly customized special service vehicle for the Office of Title I Community Schools. Approval is requested for a seven month contract with one recommended bidder and contract spending authority of $600,000 in Title I funds. Committee members, any questions? Ms. Chair. Yeah, thank ahead. you very much. Um, uh, I'm curious, what what exactly are we buying, um, Mr. Saris? Uh, we are buying a mobile unit um, that will uh, travel throughout the community. I think it's essentially 
a specially outfitted bus um, and probably Miss Stansbury or Dr. Wisted could give us more details. It's definitely not an emergency vehicle, but the contract that we found that was able to provide this included that. Okay, that's that helps a little bit. It also, I, I was reading here, it says that it will provide families in three school communities access. Is that three schools or is it beyond three schools and in, in maybe a larger area? Because I'm just, I'm curious as to its use. Yeah, so um, Mr. Kuhn, that's a great question. And uh, in a moment, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Stansberry, our Title I coordinator, who also is working with all of our community schools. Um, this, it does go beyond just those uh, schools to support the community connection. Um, and we also, for anyone who would like, in the last curriculum committee, you could see um, illustrations of the mobile unit, so you have a real sense visually of what's in this um, in this mobile bus. So, Ms. Stansberry, if you'll go ahead. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, so, the mobile unit will work with Sandalwood, Hawthorne, and Deep Creek, and because it will serve the communities and not just the selected students and families that attend those three schools, students in middle and high school may also feel the benefits of what the mobile unit has to offer. And the mobile unit will, the stakeholder committees on and all, at all three schools are working on the specifics of what they want added to the unit, but the base of the unit is a mobile food pantry, a mobile medical exam room, and a mobile learning space for families. All right, thank you. Mr. Saris, is, is it, is it a seventh month, a seven month contract because of the funding source being grants and we have to spend it by a certain time or? No. That's an uh, odd timing. Uh, we have had um, a, a, a long delivery time on these custom type vehicles and uh, I believe that's the case here. I'd, I would be delighted if we could get it in seven months. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mr. Okay, Ms. Joes, my questions? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Is, am I correct that it's one vehicle? Okay. Yes. So, and does it require, because it's it has to be a large vehicle because of these different, you know, for the lack of a better word, rooms or uh, different areas in that, is it going to require a special license like a CDL or can an ordinary person drive it? It does not require a CDO. It was a specific request from the schools. Okay. And the great part, two of those schools are in my area, uh, Sandwood and Deep Creek. And then, you know, obviously there's a lot of high schools and other schools around there too. So thank you very much. You're welcome. There being no further questions, Mr. Saris, please um, proceed with the next contract. Thank you. LKO 406-20 Mental Health Services. Uh, this is a contract modification to provide student mental health services for the Office of School Climate. Approval is requested to increase spending authority by $1.4 million, bringing the revised total contract spending authority to $1.4 million with 19 awarded contractors. Thank you, Mrs. Saros. Committee members, any questions? Hearing none, Mr. Saros, can you please proceed with the next contract? Thank you. The next item, JBO 703-22, Interactive Display Panels for Instructional Spaces. This is a new competitively bid contract <clears throat> for interactive display panels and stands for the Department of Information Technology. Approval is requested for a six year contract with two recommended bidders and contract spending authority of $18 million. Thank you, Mr. Saris. Committee members, any questions? <clears throat> Hearing, oh, Mr. Kuhn, go ahead. 
Thank you, Ms. Jose. Uh, Mr. Saris, this is a significant spend, $18 million. Um, is this $18 million over six years, like $3 million a year? The um, 18 million is the value of of 7,000 the, the screens of the 7,000 units, and we will be uh, a, a leasing lease financing arrangement will be uh, presented along with this. We also first need the budget appropriation. This is an item that's included in the FY23 uh, proposed budget. And the annual leasing cost is about 2.6 and a half million. So, so just so I'm clear, do we get, do all the classrooms get brand new screens immediately? I don't believe so. I think uh, we're going to uh, attend to the the schools with the most obsolete equipment or those who have no functional equipment. And I don't know uh, what to expect with the production and delivery of the units. I know that um, with a lot of our Chromebooks and, and laptop devices, there's a, a production cycle that's been affected by COVID and so forth. So. Uh, someone from information technology may be able to provide more detail, but I very much doubt we'll get 7,000 units in July, for example. I just didn't know if you were staggering it over six years or if the idea was to get it and pay for it over time. So, the, Mr. Yeah. Kuhn, um, yes. this, is, this is Jim Corns. Um, with Mr. Gusto's leave, I'll um, speak to this as a deployment model. Our plan is uh, to implement this across one school year, so as to not extend it through a, a, a you know an extended period of time. Um, both the logistics of deploying and delivering um, 7,000 devices um, is is a, a timed manner. In addition to this, part of this bid is also to remove um, antiquated and outdated um, solutions that are already in the classroom. So um, our goal uh, with this approval and with the budget appropriation uh, approved uh, would be to uh, implement this across one school year. And as Mr. Sarah said, focusing with the schools that are in the most dire straits and then working with our um, uh, uh, Department of Schools support to identify a rollout plan for the remainder schools. Um, Mr. Saris, thank you, Mr. Coins. I appreciate that. Um, Mr. Saris, can you can you explain the benefit of leasing? And do we actually own the equipment or have the ability to buy it at the end, or do they take it all back? Uh, they will uh, take the equipment back if it's in an acceptable condition and they'll give us a, uh, a pre-agreed upon uh, buyback uh, value. Um, the, the benefit is that at the present time, the, the interest rates uh, are highly favorable to us and the uh, the equipment uh, is replaced as needed as long as we renew that lease. Um, Mr. Corns, is there are there any other details that yeah, you're thank aware you. of? Sure. Thank, thank you, Mr. Saris. Uh, so Mr. Kuhn, the other the other upside of this also is that these panels life expectancy uh, far exceeds the lease terms. So as we grow um, uh, near the end of the the lease here, we can also make some uh, prudent decisions based on the uh, condition of the panels and mm -hmm. the growth of technology. So if we, uh, for example, say to uh, move into a seventh year, um, the the purchase of these um, leases, uh, uh, the, per the buyout of the lease would allow us to do so uh, with the availability of having that the, the gauging of whether or not we could gap uh, into the next refresh based on technological changes and, you know, just condition and wear and tear. 
Okay, I guess, thank you. I don't know if other <laughs> other folks have questions. This is just a significant amount of money. Um, and I know that there is a smattering of these devices across the county. Um, I'm, you know, I'm interested in getting the best technology we can in to, um, into schools. It also mentions that there are two separate units, Promethean and Clary panels. So I don't know if there's a difference or if we're going with one or the other, or if there's a preference to go with something else. So Mr. Kuhn, we currently have these display panels uh, have been deployed at all of our new constructions. Uh, in this model. So um, on, on one hand, we would be not deploying to those uh, schools, uh, but those schools also have uh, been using one of these brands, whereas uh, both of these brands met our specification for the bid. So <clears throat> we are trying to keep a homogeneous set of panels at each school. So that's why you'll see two. Um, and this is uh, by and far one of the uh, most requested things that uh, my office gets from a classroom technology standpoint right after um, uh, devices themselves. So um, it, it is a definite need uh, for doing whole group instruction as well as small group um, uh, collaboration. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, committee members, any more questions? Hearing none, I think the next contract is Mr. Dixit's. So good evening again. Uh, the next contract item 7 GDA 314. Just a minute, Mr. Mr. Dixit, just a minute. I think uh, Ms. Casey has a question. Good afternoon, Chair, uh, Chairwoman Joes. This is Ms. Causey. I am not a member of the contract committee, uh, but I did have a question if I would be able to ask that. Yeah, go ahead. Please proceed with your question, Ms. Causey. Thank you, Ms. Joes. Um, so recently the board supported the superintendent's recommendation to implement the public works. Um, consultant recommendations to create a position for a chief information officer. And the board also recently approved the appointment recommended by um, Dr. Williams. And my understanding is the uh, our new CIO has been on board for about a week. Is that correct? Hi, this is Pedro Gusto. I am the, the new chief information officer. So um, yes, I've been on board since Wednesday, so. This will be my fourth um, actual work day on the job. Well, good afternoon and welcome. Thank you. To Team BCPS. Um, one of my questions was, this is a significant um, amount of money, but it's also a significant amount of um, human resources in terms of implementation. Um, the delivery, as uh, Mr. Corns pointed out, uh, the rollout, but also in terms of the um, staff that will be using this equipment, some of them for the first time. So one of the things that we've been hearing um, from our staff, and um, a lot of this is documented in the Public Works Recommendation Report, which is um, a mere 750 pages. Um, but in any case, is the uh, the <clears throat> desire to not have uh, a lot of new initiatives or any new initiatives and to have technology that is um, easy to use or easy to support. So I'm curious if um, I guess what I would like to see is and I think would make sense is that you would have more time to evaluate um, all of the IT infrastructure, um, maybe have focus groups, I'm sure as you're transition mm -hmm. transitioning meeting some of the stakeholders, key stakeholders in our uh, bargaining unit leadership uh, to understand the perspective of their members um, before that we would initiate this um, massive of, a, of an implementation. So I'm just um, wondering if there's, I understand there is an urgent need for some number of um, projectors that teachers are saying things are breaking and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, that perhaps if we proceeded with 
the most urgent needs, but then give you time to really evaluate, is this the direction? Is this the best technology? Um, so that's an open-ended question. Mr. Rossi, it looks like you have elaborate questions. Could you put that in an email and send it to Mr. Gosto? Um, yes. That's be appreciated. Um, we can answer them certainly at tomorrow's board meeting. However, I do want to clarify what was just said is that all our new schools do have this technology. So it's also coming in from a point of equity. And as you heard Mr. Korn say, our teachers, our students love it. Um, so that's why this contract has been bought, bought for. That it's not fair that some schools have it. The old schools, our Title I schools don't have it. So we have to evaluate everything from an equity point of view too. We can have some kids with Promethean boards and some with the Blackboard. So when you answer those questions, Mr. Gasto, please keep that in mind. This is a school cool. system. Thank you. I will. Thank you. Um, Mr. Dixit, if you could proceed with the next contract, please. So the next next contract is GDA 314-22, and this is for HVAC supplies. It's one of the several contracts for these supplies. This one is just a consent to assignment. There is no change in amount or term. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Uh, committee members, any questions? Hearing none. Um, if anybody has. Do you have a question regarding this, Ms. Causey, this contract? Thank you, Ms. Joes. Uh, my follow up was related to the um, question of the Title I schools, and my understanding is that um, the Title I schools were able with a um, specific grant to receive Promethean boards. So I totally Ms. support Causey, that there is a need to evaluate on. what is you can put that in an email, Ms. Causey. We moved on to the next contract. Do you have any questions related to this contract, committee members? Please put that in an email. Certainly, uh, thank you. You're welcome. Hearing none, Mr. Dixit, please proceed to the next contract. Item 8 is contract KSH340-18, and this is for testing, maintaining, repairing, and upgrading fire alarm system at different locations. This is also a consent to assignment. No change in uh, term. So your request is no change in amount or term. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Committee members, any questions? Mr. McMillian? Mr. Kuhn? Hearing none, Mr. Dixit, please proceed with the next contract. So item 9 ASI 810-22 is for HVAC parts, supplies and material. It is to extend the term of the contract and there is no change in the amount. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Committee members, any questions? Hearing none, Mr. Dixit, please proceed with the next contract. Uh, item 10 KSH-354-18 is for purchase of lumber and plywood. These materials are used by facilities and CTA and fine arts. Uh, we are requesting an addition of $221,673. So the total contract amount after the modification will be $496,000. 673. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Committee members, any questions? Hearing none, please move on to the next contract. Okay, the next contract is for purchase of relocatable classrooms. And I'd like to provide a little bit of backup information for this, if I, if I may. Uh, the spending increase is from 1.7 million to 6.266068. There is an increased amount of 4,566,000. Primarily, it is due to a need for 18 unit classroom uh, addition, uh, modular addition till the construction 
of a permanent uh, addition is completed for Dundalk High School. And so we'll take next several years to accommodate kids uh, in this uh, modular kind of construction where units will be combined uh, and provide bathroom facilities in that addition, temporary addition. Uh, that's what is needed. The funds used will be capital funds, and we are trying to expedite this to at least try to complete it before the school starts. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Committee members, any questions? Looks like Mr. Kuhn has one. Thank you. I, Mr. Dixit, I thought that we had um, approved a large sum before for these relocatables. Am I missing something or misremembering? Because I, I thought we had a really big one not too long ago. You you are absolutely right. The original amount um, that I have, uh, let me check that to make sure I'm correct. This contract is for purchase of relocatable classroom. So the amount approved before was $1.7 million. That was for purchase. There are a couple of different contracts, some for leasing, some for purchase. Uh, so the purchase one was only for $1.7 million. And in this particular case, it'll be more cost effective to purchase these units because what we plan to do, we see other projects on the horizon that might be able to use this modular structure consisting of relocatable classrooms. So if we can complete this project, we are in a position to move it to the next project which will have need for this. And just so I'm clear, this, this is specific to the Dundalk High School um, expansion to add it says 18 re relocatables. Is it, is it beyond that also? It's that plus whatever else you need, or is it specifically for that? So the um, the request for addition is about four point five million dollar. Out of that is approximately three million dollar is for this modular structure, and the the rest is for increasing need in gender. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dixit. Uh, Mr. McMillian. Please proceed with your question. Mr. Dixon, so it's an 18 trailer complex like something similar to what Patapsco has now in their courtyard between their wings? It is similar to that and it is more similar to what we use for Pikesville High School and for Milfordville in the past. All the difference is instead of separate relocatables, they are all bunched together. And instead of kids going from relocatable to the main building for use of bathrooms, this modular structure includes bathroom facilities within that complex. Yeah, and I think that's how Patapsco is. And if I I'm think, not mistaken, I think, yes, you are absolutely right. Yeah, and if I'm not mistaken, people told me that the Patapsco complex came from Milford Mill. That's right. And okay. we want to and do the same thing. And that that complex was used for Milford Mill. It was used for Pikesville. So it paid for itself when you use it for three schools. And we want to replicate the same again to buy this one and use it for future high schools that we have been talking about. OK, and so if that's an 18 trailer complex, how many trailers right now are sitting on Dundalk? Do you know that offhand? It's about 12 or maybe 14 somewhere in there. So this will they are scattered all over the place right, right. And, and administration has a lot of issues with that. So this will consolidate the students in one modular structure. OK, and I just want to be on the record to state. So, uh, you know, the 14 or, or 12 or whatever and 18, we're looking at 30. patapsco has got close to 20. There's almost that, you know, it's safe to say there's 45 trailer complexes or trailers and a couple of them in complexes within the two two high schools in the southeast area, and that's not even including Spares Point. I just don't want to be so I know that the overcrowding analysis is coming forth, you know, to be released soon. So I'm looking forward to that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Committee members or board members, any questions? Ms. Causey, do you have a question? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for this information. 
Um, there is a report that is available, and I think it would be helpful for the board to receive an updated version of where the relocatables are currently located um, around all the schools and identifying which ones are leased and which ones are owned, and also um, how long they've been there and what is the age of the relocatable. Um, <clears throat> Because it is an issue, as and, and as Mr. McMillian is pointing out, there are some schools that have had relocatables for years um, that do not yet have solutions to their overcrowding. And uh, so for some uh, schools, they're going to receive these upgraded versions, but for a shorter amount of time. Um, so I think it would be helpful for the board to understand countywide what is the situation currently and then what is the incremental cost? Um, and also a specific question is how long do these relocatables last and what is the cost of moving them? And when we're done using them, is there an ability to sell them or is there space to store them? So there were a lot of questions there. Let me try to answer some of them uh, and all these questions are very good Ms. Causey. Most of this information is already available to board members as part of the educational facilities master plan that's submitted to state. We provide inventory uh, of all the relocatables and where they are located as part of our budget justification operating budget justification. We provide uh, total amounts that are needed for replacing, for leasing, and in each individual case, uh, our team makes an economic analysis to see uh, what is the most cost effective solution for that application. In the past, we have been trying to use more and more of leased units because uh, uh, it is difficult to uh, get funding for doing repairs and leasing includes installation and repairs but it may vary from uh, application to application. The life of relocatable is it's a range depends on the use of that, how students use those facilities. Uh, it could be 15 years, but some of our relocatables are older than that. And there's another set of uh, contract for repairing those units that we own and that need repair. So a lot of questions that you have asked are really good questions and responses are included in different document that board gets to review it. OK, thank you for that, and that would be helpful if um, you know those could be pulled together and attached to board docs for tomorrow. But my other question is, so so how old are the Potapsco relocatables? So Potapsco relocatables were purchased, if my memory is right, for Milford Mill reno renovation, and they were moved to uh, Pikesville after that and from Pikesville they came here so definitely around 10 15 years if not more. I can get the exact age for you. Could you okay. put that in email Mr. Dixon? So the other question is um, are any of these relocatables for Towson High School? I don't know at this point what we'll be doing for Towson High School but if past is any indicator and depending on the schedule of completion of jobs, if these relocatables are needed and if the decision is to put a Towson, we can move that. If it is for any other school, we can move these relocatables there, just like we did for Pikesville, Milford Mill, and now at Potapsco. Okay, and uh, one concern I have is Towson High School has a very small campus with an environmentally sensitive stream running through it. It's a very tight, um, campus as it is um, and to um, you know include on that construction and then include on that um, relocatables um, could make it a potentially very um, impractical and possibly dangerous situation and we've heard from community members that they um, are interested in the school system looking at swing space so that it can keep uh, the students and staff safe having their programs that uh, but also decreasing construction time and thereby saving money. Uh, Ms. Nazi, this is not so relevant to the contract. Um, do you have something contract specific about the relocatables? 
yes, I'm I am. I want to understand if any of these are for Towson High School, whose community has said they're very interested in having swing space because of the factors I just mentioned. So, right, and Mr. Dixon really gets directly to you on that. And as terms of the environmentally sensitive stream, um, they do this all the time. And Mr. Dixit, you can get back to us on the construction portion um, and the relocatables as well. Thank you. So just, just uh, since Ms. Kazi has asked this question, let me close it by making one statement here, if I may, Ms. Chose. Yes, please so, keep it brief. So uh, during the design development phase, we look at all of the options for accommodating uh, students, and it will be shared with the community design during the design development stage. So you can be sure community will be informed and will be participating in those decisions, and uh, it will be uh, a process which will be extremely transparent. Thank you for giving me a chance to make that statement. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Any more questions, committee members? Well, Ms. Jose, I just I just wanted to say that I have to leave the meeting. I have a hard stop. So I just want to thank everyone for for answering all of our questions. I do have some questions regarding some of the construction um, contracts, but I look forward to asking them tomorrow. Ms. Thank Ms. you very much. You, just so that you know, once you leave, you'll no longer have a quorum of the committee, so we will not be able to vote on any of the items since Ms. Hen and Ms. Um, Mr. Offerman are not present for the record. Right. I, like I said, um, I apologize, but I, I, I have to go. I have a hard stop. Um, so I guess we can try and vote on lots of them tomorrow together. Thank you. Mr. Dixit, please proceed with the next contract. So the next contract is MBU 507-18. It is for security systems and access control installation for maintenance, repair, parts, and preventive maintenance. The request is to increase the contract by $1 million, and the justification for this request is to be able to use this contract for a $1 million grant that we have received under State Capital Improvement Grant School Safety Grant Program. No change in term of contract is is needed and the funds are available through this grant. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Mr. McMillian, do you have any questions? Hearing none, Mr. Dixit, can you proceed with the next contract? The next is CWA-116-22 for inspection and cleaning of kitchen hood and associated exhaust fans. The contract is for $300,000. It's a new contract with five year term. Um, it is needed to perform preventive maintenance for that equipment and to meet all the regulatory requirements. Um, the contractors are for environmental cleaning services, AKA interim maintenance company of Lansdowne, Pennsylvania and total kitchen care from Millersville, Maryland. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Um, any questions, committee members? Hearing none, please proceed with the next contract, Mr. Dixit. Item 14 is GDA-312-22, and this is for on-call architectural consultant contracts for design services for roofing jobs. Uh, as you will recall, there are a lot of roofing systemics that have been approved and we are pursuing design, bid, build model due to some of the audits recommendation in the past. The contract is for not to exceed $3 million. 90% of these funds are from capital funds and it will be for next several years. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Um, do you have any questions, Mr. McMillian? Hearing none, please proceed with the next contract. So, Ms. Jones, we have items 15 through 38 for two construction projects. 
I have spent some time to summarize it in the interest of time. The first project or Mr. CGC. Richard, just yes. a minute, since we don't have a quorum, um, I need to verify from um, legal if we can continue this meeting or not. Well, actually, Ms. Causey is here, so we do have a quorum, but we don't have a quorum of the committee. Uh, can some, is Ms. Howie present? I know we can't vote, but can we continue with the review of the meetings? Uh, we may have to end the meetings and I, um, because we don't have a quorum and I have, so we'll just review it tomorrow. Uh, it's most disappointing because these meetings were moved to 5.30 because in the specific request of Ms. Hen and Mr. Kuhn, who couldn't attend at four o'clock, and now we have committee members that are not, um, I'll show my face, that are not uh, committed enough to come and waste the time of several, cha uh, several staff members and uh, board members is myself and Mr. McMillian, so that is most disappointing. So unfortunately, Mr. Dixit, um, I will have to adjourn the meeting. We can't vote on any of these contracts and we'll have to take all of this to the to the uh, board tomorrow. Mr. McMillian, do you have any questions? Hearing none. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Ms. Jones. I was on mute. No, thank you. I have no questions. All right, since we don't have a quorum, I'm going to end the meeting. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody, and apologize uh, on behalf of the board for um, this unprofessionalism. So see you guys all tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.